who wants to be the first one to volunteer to tell me what function that they're looking at and how they're going to be measuring it? And again, it could be a hospital situation or some other industry. Very good, I appreciate it. We need to give her applause. Yeah. <laughs> Being person being what? Uh, being uh, in, in front of the physician. Okay. In front of the physician, and you have to know how well are you doing. You have to have a good diagnosis. And actually, this is the part of the production area in a hospital. So, if you want, uh, we want to measure something. Should I write it here? Yes, that'd be fine. Right. We'll even give you enough room here so you don't fall at all. We choose um, as indicators for the process the duration of the patient is being uh, consulted. So how long? About the quality of the medical act, we say um, the percentage of uh, miss uh, of wrong diagnosis. Okay. Another indicator about the process could be how many on-time consultancies have been made. I mean, I'm the patient, I have to get in at 11.30, how many of them have been on-time? So you're looking at that as attribute, on-time or not? Or you could say it as how late are you? Yeah. Okay, you the could choose two different ways of looking mm -hmm. at that. So in other words, if the, it was 11 o'clock appointment, and you're one minute late, that'd be one. If you're one minute earlier, it's a minus one. Or you could look at it as three minutes late, five minutes late. Oh. Because if, if, a, if you're in the appointment, are you, if the doctor misses it by one minute versus 50 minutes, it's a difference. It's a difference, right? Yeah. Okay. So minutes late. Minutes late, okay. Also, because uh, I want to, to make uh, some money and I want to know about the productivity of my uh, consulting process, so it would be how much money I make per physician per day. Okay, very that good. In the sales, sales per doctor per day, say. Um, another thing to measure that is also related with the customer experience could be the lead time. I'm calling to make an appointment, the lead time from the call that I make until I'm in the front of the physician. So I think okay. we want to measure Good. that. That's excellent. Lead time, call to say in face of doctor. Mm -hmm. This includes demand, so I'm in. I'm in the physician. And another, um, we have a lot of indicators. Mm -hmm. So about the quality, we thought it's important to measure the quality of the of doctor performing the consultancy. We have here the number of diagnoses, but this is something that we don't always know, only if the customers comes back to complain. Usually it doesn't happen until it's very bad results. Yes. <laughs> So how could we measure the quality of the act, of the production to say? We can have a checklist, survey when leaving. And also, if you, we really want to know if the diagnosis was well, we can make a follow-up in two months with several customers to say, was the diagnosis okay and the treatment okay? Very good. So this is measuring the quality. Follow-up survey, and this will be not 100% in two months. S 
So that's it. That's very good. Very good. Well, give her a hand. She did a great job. Okay, so these are, these are really good metrics that you had for uh, dealing with the physicians. See, she, she actually included it by, do, uh, uh, by the doctor here, too. So we could, from an overall hospital, collect all the doctors, looking at relative to these metrics, or we could go in and look at an individual doctor. And those can go in and cascade, you know, go upward to an overall metric. So the idea is then that uh, at the executive levels, they could click on it to look at overall on all these different metrics that you have here and tracking them just like I suggested over time. And, but then the individual doctors could actually look at their metrics. You can also go in and combine them so that now we can get a comparison between the physicians. We can also maybe say, well, you might have some specialists and it's gonna to have to have a little different metric. So you might have to break it out to a general practitioner versus some other specialist. You might have to break it out differently. So any thoughts about what you mentioned here? Now, how would you track this over time? We'll just get into this here, like duration. Are you thinking about trying? Do you think we want to track it every, every incident? Probably not, right? It's too expensive. It's too expensive, but there may be some trends. Do you, remember, I'm talking about this 30,000 foot level view. Okay, remember, I'm not trying to make it dynamic so I react to things right away. I'm trying to get a high level view of how the process is performing. So do you think duration uh, might be different by time, uh, by time of day? Yeah, it could be, right? Maybe the first patient, it's not as long. You know, it could be varied by that, right? So what about by uh, day of the week? You think that some of these metrics might be differences by day of the week? Maybe the wait time or the lead times could make a difference by day of the week, right? Could be? Okay, we agree on that? So what we might want to do is what we call subgrouping it. We're going to do it every week. So we'll track the average for these values like the uh, uh, well, we could look at, let's take one of them here, duration here. So this was, you come into the office and how, or the, the doctor comes in and how long does it take for the doctor to get, physician to get done? So we might want to look at the average of all the doctors every week and also the standard deviation or variability. And we track that over time to see if it's stable. And then we could do a probability plot on that to describe, hey, the median time is this, and 80% of the time it's between here and here. And then we could report that out throughout the organization. What about, let's take percent of wrong diagnosis. You familiar with continuous response or attribute? Pass or fail? Pass or fail is um, attribute. Continuous is the number far as actually the duration. Does it take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 12 minutes? That's a continuous response. So this would here, the uh, wrong diagnosis. So they came back and you misdiagnosed it. So maybe every week that we count the number of patients that we did and how many were misdiagnosed. misdiagnosed. Okay, so these would be the 30,000 foot level metrics. The point that you were making earlier, putting together these charts have a certain amount of complexity to them in how you're gonna figure out the subgroups and decide upon the techniques as I just described, which particular approach that you're gonna be using. But the interpretation is gonna be very similar 
that you have that statement down the bottom describes how your process is performing. And what we want to lead to is that it becomes clickable. Okay. So I think she did an excellent job, or that team did an excellent job on putting together um, some metrics for the physician. Is there an example that somebody liked to share that they had in a particular industry? Another function within the industry, how they uh, pick their metrics? Am I going to have to call on the table here? <laughs> what did you guys come up with? Did you have a... We did hospital as well. You did a hospital? Yeah. Which, one, which function did you use? The voice of the customer. Voice of the customer? Well, why don't you come up and, and show us what metrics you came up with? Okay. Thank you for volunteering. Sure. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. So we have thought about the voice of the customer. And uh, we tried to see what metrics we should be checking um, for our hospital. And mainly we tried to look up three main um, aspects. Uh, and then we deep dive into each of those to see more exact metrics. So one is uh, with regarding the cost, uh, the speed or the time it takes for uh, the customer to have um, his problem fixed, and then the competence of the hospital. And then we, uh, we haven't spent too much time on the cost side. Obviously, it's part of the customer satisfaction how much they pay for the service. Um, and uh, some of the metrics we have uh, thought of, it's the waiting time since the customer comes in the hospital. I think this repeats what uh, my previous speaker said. So uh, the time spent. Um, we were looking also on the, um, we also said that some of the things can be measured uh, in an objective matter, while some others have to be measured subjectively by uh, the customer's opinion with regard to whether they are satisfied or not. Um, we also had two other metrics, which is um, uh, the rate of return. So we, we have checked uh, with regard to the competence if the customer, how many times the customer returns with the same, uh, with the same issue. And then uh, obviously the, le uh, the lesser the number of returns, the better. And then uh, the return rate on a new, um, on new issues. where the higher the better. So this proves the customer trust in the hospital's competence. Uh, then we looked on um, a subjective, uh, uh, of subjective uh, approach, uh, which is uh, how the customer feels the, uh, the environment, how clean it is. Um, and this is something that can be evaluated by a questionnaire or uh, a call afterwards. We looked at the temperature in the hospital, and this we can measure to make sure that it is within the comfort zones. Uh, whether or not they have a parking lot, so we take the average of the customers and try to provide the parking lot. If, uh, and this we thought that uh, we can measure ob objectively and will contribute to the customer satisfaction. Um, and then also in the competent size, uh, side, um, how many times he's been sent to another uh, location to have his problem fixed. Um, and obviously the less the better. I would say reallocation, but. Let's 
So I think, yeah, this is around the cost, competence, and the environment. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you see an overlap that there may be a little bit of overlap with the other one that was earlier? You know, because like sometimes you got the duration here. Like this, because putting together these metrics, there's not one right way of doing it, but it can, it's not trivial either. So you want to try to figure out how you're looking at it. So uh, like the duration here is kind of overlap. This is uh, some of these things are operational things. Now the other thing is you could have on customer satisfaction, you know how happy you are, you know. And then you could have a Likert scale, and then you can go in and do some other techniques to uh, see how well they're doing. Now, one of the things I had was uh, for the voice of the customer here. It's back here. This is some of the things I thought about for voice of the customer, for what I came up with here. Like complaints. Receive the complaint, document the complaint. Keep in mind what I'm really looking for here with this methodology is trying to figure out what I should do to improve my overall performance. I'm really not as interested in, in addressing the issues of the day. Don't get me wrong, those need to get addressed. But what I'm trying to look at is trying to give me data and information that's going to help me improve. So I came out with complaints, you know, receive the complaint, document it in the database. This is basically the process. Evaluation of complaints by the enterprise. This is a group here that I'm, I'm suggesting that puts it all together, basically, that enterprise process management. And I'll talk about them a little later. Document the results in the data warehouse. So we want to figure out what kind of complaint, complaints that we're getting, basically, when we do. And the data warehouse is down here. So audits, weekly someone acts as a customer and documents the findings. So you go through and, and start examining what's happening in the process. But notice here, you're just documenting what's happening. Of, and you know, issues that you saw. Surveys, also you could conduct random surveys about the system of problems and one suggestion that they would be done differently. And then this would be a surveys externally. So I'm actually going out and talking to people and find out what issues did they have. Another one is internal surveys, okay? And this was um, one twelfth of the employees every month. And I talked about implementing Six Sigma and put this. This one actually came about from uh, when I worked at IBM. They did annual opinion surveys, and I had a very diligent manager. And we talked about the results, not one day, but it actually went into the second day, just talking about the results. And I said, my goodness, this seems like a waste to me. You know, for everybody, every manager in the company actually going through that with their employees. So I suggested a different way of evaluating uh, surveys is you could go in and like one twelfth of uh, all the uh, employees, the physicians, nurses, and whoever, and you basically ask them some generic questions. And, and then you can go in and ask them also what they might suggest that you could do to improve. Okay, so you wanna make also your customers happy from the, uh, uh, that's your employees too. And then the data warehouse we want to go in and statistically analyze this uh, retention rate and so on, because I want to look at how, so how long does employees within the organization actually stay there. We don't want to have nurses just leaving because they're just unhappy or whatever. And then we want to go in and report these metrics out uh, and figure out what we should do differently. Anyway, that's my thoughts on what, because the uh, voice of the customer is kind of a hard one to actually work on, for whatever it's worth. Uh, may I have a comment? Yes. Uh, I think that actually we speak about two voice, about two voice of the customer. If you stay here on this flow, on the larger one, just this to one? answer like, no, no, the, 
the same, but here. Okay, so we might have a voice of the customer when we produce and deliver the product because we are running in a continuous improvement on the actual product, which has been already pointed out before uh, on this issue. But if we go to the left to the voice of the customer before to develop the product, then we actually take the, as the input, the voice of the customer for the current product, similar, and also the voice of the customer in the meaning of the market, to see for the new product what is interesting for them, we combine them, and this should support to develop the product. So I mean, in this situation, before to develop the product, the voice of the customer is a combination, okay. in my opinion. One of the things I think, I'm glad you brought this up, I am not looking at this as necessarily a sequence here. This all happens at one time, okay? So that you're continually getting voice of the customer over here, um, but now, when I think you look at what you're talking about, if I understand correctly, is more developing the product. Where now we're looking at the voice of the customer before I decide I'm going to uh, develop a new process or I'm deciding what to actually uh, do a different, I'm gonna add a different, um, uh, maybe I never did heart transplants. You know, and so I'm gonna look at uh, creating that process. And now I wanna get definitely a voice of the customer for that particular operation or that procedure that you're looking at doing. If you're making a particular new product, I wanna get a good voice of the customer in the front end. So that's one thing. This is what I was looking at as voice of the customer. Not so much this is a time sequence from a process, but overall, you know, on a continuing okay. basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. Okay, so this is, uh, we have, how about one more? Does somebody have one more? Do you have, does anybody have one for a function that wasn't related to a hospital? Or let's take an example uh, or situation and let's create it as a group. Uh, does somebody have a particular function that they uh, would like to create the metrics for? Yes. Generic, <laughs> without uh, having the, uh, without us uh, saying that I uh, mentioned everything. Okay. First of all, we started with uh, measuring the volume of production because we have to meet expectations. Sales probably asks us for a certain volume. And related to the volume of production, we took also in con under control the volume of nonconformity because this is uh, something which uh, is costing us very much. Can so uh, you let me write it down for you? Yeah. No, no, I'll write okay. it. Thank you. Although I'm very poor with writing. Well, we're two of a kind on that one. <laughs> Talking about money, we also want to know how much does it cost, cost of non-conformity. Oh, Ooh. sorry. We're gonna try to improve this process here. <laughs> improve this process, <laughs> thank you. Um, we are also uh, looking for production costs, uh, no, purchasing costs. Utility costs, labor costs, labor costs, because generic allergies are areas which a lot of things can be improved, so it's always room for change. Uh, delivery costs, and uh, on time delivery. rate to satisfy our clients. Customer satisfaction. And um, I'm trying now 
also to measure um, the impact of change because uh, although we will start and initiate some changes, as a manager I would like to keep under the control this change and I would like progress in change projects. And also I want to measure impact of change. Because change for me, it's not just a purpose, it should be a tool to improve. So if the project of change does not produce the impact I was expecting, I would like to change the change in order to achieve the impact. Because at the end of the day, profit might be one of the dimension which rules my activity. Uh, just on one spot. Okay, very good. Very on the spot. Very good, well, thank you. Ah, no. Yeah, notice, notice how she and the first ones I wanted to point out, she had quality, cost, and time in here. You know, like you had the, the quality, this is a nonconformity. So you had, and then you had also on time delivery would be time, you know, and then also, uh, you know, you had cost in here too, various costs that you had in here. So those are the three things I like to look for, you know, is kind of give me some thinking about those. Now, when you start looking at quality, you can actually break it down to, into different type of quality issues. And like I was helping the mining company build this value chain, we were looking at uh, silica is a contaminant. So uh, how much silica do you have in there, you know, and other, the other type of contaminants that you had uh, in your, your product that you're producing. So you can have those kind of uh, fold on up. And what we like to have it also, so that these uh, charts and way we present it is automatically updated too. Okay, good. So any other, qu any questions on this? Do you have the general idea? Again, it's important if you're, if you, can everybody relate to how they can relate it to your situation? Okay, let's, let's go in and ask a couple of people, uh, how about you? What kind of function that you might uh, look at relative to, to metrics? I'm particularly interested, in, I'm particularly interested now in the uh, invoice and collect payment because... Uh, What's that? Invoice and collect yeah. payment. Yeah, uh -huh, very good. <coughs> invoice, collect payment. And because it seems to be... I'm working in a, a telecom company and uh, it seems to be a hot topic today. So, so what metrics might you have for that one? Invoice is not collected uh, in due date. Invoice is collected um, after first measure taken for uh, remediating the specific situation. Um, number of uh, invoices issued in on time or um, number of uh, invo invoices issued for which um, uh, subsequent to work will be will be done, meaning correction or something like this. You could even look at the cost of doing the invoices too. The department costs? Yes. You could look at the cost per invoice for all the, you don't get that for free for actually people doing the work. Because we might want to look at how we're going to do the cost, uh, reduce the cost. Cost with collection agencies, for example. That's right. You could look at the cost per collection, but even the salaries and the overhead of people. You know, how can you go in and actually use their time more efficiently to actually process those transactions? Notice what we're going to be leading to if you're trying to become more profitable, not that everybody needs to reduce their cost. But what we're going to do is try to figure out where you should be focusing your efforts. Like the mining company I was telling you about is that we started looking at how much it was costing to actually uh, procure equipment and things. And it was actually rising. But until you start looking at it this way, you just didn't know that. Okay, good. Well, okay, I'm moving on here. So I'm hopefully everybody's got an idea how it applies to their particular situation, which I think is really important. Let's see.
Okay, so now what we're going to do is move on, on to analyze the enterprise. This is step three. So we've got our value chain, and we're going to go in and start evaluating that to figure out where we should focus our improvement efforts. So just to reiterate, I'm suggesting what we're going to, not going to do is do across the board cuts, if we're, you know, expenses and things like that. We're going to try to figure out where we mess, uh, be most beneficial to improve our operations. Now, it may be that we really want to focus on improving the top line. So often organizations want to try to cut costs, which is fine, but where is the most beneficial area to cut costs so that you do not impact the enterprise as a whole or its profitability? And we don't want to be also short-sighted. So some of the things we want to look for is the constraints. You know, for example, if we've got excess capacity and um, we figure out, well, maybe our constraint is really our sales and marketing. What about maybe defect reduction opportunities? That may be the biggest issue, or we might have waste, speed to market, or there could be other things. So we want to really go in and analyze the enterprise as a whole, and one of the pieces that we're going to be looking at is the overall uh, value chain. Then what we want to do now is create smart, that specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and time-based uh, satellite-level metric goals. So these are our, our, our metrics like profit, margins, or year-over-year -year growth. So we may want to establish some uh, goals for those profit margins, for example. But they need to be realistic. So for example, if we have a situation where um, we've, uh, uh, our current profit margins are at 10% and our competitors are at 12%, then a reasonable goal might be to move the average profit margins up from 10% to 12% in the next uh, seven months. But however, if our profit margins are 10% and our competitors are at 8%, then we might want to make a statement that we don't want to make it any worse than it is because we're already doing fairly good. In other words, we don't want to set these goals out where we're shooting for the moon that are just not realistic and it can lead to unhealthy behaviors. The next thing we want to look for is creating strategies. So we want to get strategies now that are really aligned to the financials. And we like to have them worded so that we can get our arms around them and that it eventually leads to projects that are going to positively impact the overall financials. So let's look at now we're moving down to step number six. We want to identify high potential areas to work on. So we're looking at our 30,000 foot level metrics throughout the organization, trying to figure out where we should be focusing our efforts. So then we also want to look at other areas of the business that are not to degrade from our current performance level. Notice by these two statements, what I'm suggesting is every metric does not need to improve. So we're trying to focus on where we should be improving our 30,000 foot level metrics that's gonna impact the satellite level metrics the most. Now, relative to business process management, that integration, we may have an operations person that's actually working to improve their metrics. There's nothing wrong with that, that's fine. They might wanna do a Kaizen event you know, Lean Project, Lean Six Sigma Project. They want to do a 5S, that's basically housekeeping, to clean out a supply cage. That's fine. Go ahead and do that. That's part of business process management. But if you're doing a Kaizen event and you, you're not just doing it for the sake of doing it, I want to improve a metric that's important to my particular piece of the business. So that becomes part of the day-to-day -day operations that you have within your organization on business process management. Also as part of this, we're really looking at 
um, maybe eventually automating some of these processes like we talked about, you know, uh, Don was talking about earlier is the, with the, with the in IT. But I don't want to just go in and automate processes. I want to figure out which processes to automate that's going to impact the enterprise as a whole the most. So these are some things to consider. The value chain metrics, also the, uh, the drill downs of these. So we had talked about the uh, evaluating the physicians. Okay, so for this particular case, we may want to look at a high level as far as the, uh, the waiting time for each one of the uh, physicians. And then we want to maybe drill down to find out that certain physicians um, are not as diligent about uh, uh, trying to reduce the amount of time people have to wait than other ones. So those are some things that we might want to look at, or even by revenue by the physicians, if that's what you're looking at. Um, we don't want to establish a, a, a thinking that we're going to be beating up on people, but we want to uh, put out everything there where everybody can see it so that then uh, we actually improve the enterprise as a whole and things don't get uh, shoved under the carpet. <clears throat> We also want to look at competitor pressures. So we want to look at how uh, our competition is doing relative to some of these metrics. You know, why maybe somebody are choosing our competitor's product versus our products, and how we're going to uh, do some things differently to go in and make it so that uh, uh, they enjoy the benefits of our products. We want to also look at the business environment. And we may uh, find for our particular uh, services that we're currently providing, it's pretty much saturated. You know, and, and now it's become a commodity. So by looking at this, we might say, gee whiz, we need to go in and do something a little bit differently uh, as far as our offerings go. We want to look at bottlenecks. You know, again, if you've um, got excess capacity, sales and marketing could be your bottleneck. On the other side is if you um, have uh, not excess capacity and you're running a lot of um, overtime, then you want to really maybe focus on what you could do to streamline your operations. The other thing is uh, I think it's really important to uh, consider is how are we going to actually change policies? You know, you know, one company I was uh, talking to, they were having a lot of difficulties uh, because the um, the cycle or the annual uh, year was based on the calendar. And so the salespeople were going in and, and trying to really generate a lot of additional revenue to meet their numbers because then they got bonuses. Okay, well, that just happened to be the same time as the holiday season. Okay? So now there's less people to actually do the work and it creates more overtime and also uh, disruptions and also perhaps more defective rates. So we want to go in and, and evaluate that because maybe what we need to eventually get to the point is we need to change a policy. This could be uh, compensating uh, salespeople for the bottom line or we're not saying is that you've got to go in and have more of an evenly distributed uh, uh, sales um, so that now we're not waiting to the end of the month where it really breaks the back of manufacturing to actually produce these particular products or deliver those products in a timely fashion. And then also, as I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, new business opportunities. Is there something that we need to be starting focusing on because now uh, what we're actually working on is a commodity and we really want to have be more of a leading company for products that we offer. So what I'm leading to now is step number uh, seven here is we want to get the projects. Notice how before I described how uh, in Lean Six Sigma that we were uh, typically selecting projects from a list that came from executives. And those kind of cascaded on down to the organization. So I call that a push for project creation. So what I'm suggesting instead of this approach is we start out with step number four is the business goals. So in this case, we're talking about increased monthly profit margins by 2% in 10 months. Okay? And then step number five would be increased monthly gross revenue by 8% in 10 months. Okay? 
So now, so we can, we're trying to increase the top line here because we got so much fixed cost. So notice how that's lined to step number five. So this is kind of, this is my step four to five. So I'm establishing smart satellite level metric goals. That's step four. Step five is create strategies. So this is what we're working on here. And step six is high potential areas and establish smart 30,000 foot level metric goals. So improve marketing effectiveness by 10% in 15 months, 10 months, okay? Reduce the day sales outstanding mean by three days in seven months. Reduce the um, you know, RFQs, acceptance rates, by improving quote response time so that quotes are completed in 14 days and then we're gonna complete this five months. So notice what I've just done with this. These are metrics that are in the value chain. So these are metrics that we want to improve and notice how we've connected them to our overall business goals, profit margins. And then what we do is now that leads to a specific project that we're working on. So notice now when we have projects that we're actually tying these back up to the business goals as a whole. Okay? No questions on that? So how, how many people have done Lean Six Sigma? Okay. It's, okay, how about you? There in, uh, it, do you see a little bit difference in how uh, project selection is in this uh, this fashion rel relative to what's He's not going to volunteer there. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically the same uh, structure of approach that we take to identify uh, opportunities for uh, for improvement. Uh, it, it's uh, an exercise we are doing um, for several months for uh, planning of a, of a year. And um, there is a dynamic of uh, selection of the improvement areas and establishing the, the goals for, uh, for improvement. Because during uh, several months, things are sometimes changing. So we review uh, regularly this. And uh, when we start a new year, we have clearly defined these uh, goals. Yeah. And so you see how what we're trying to do here is align it to the process metrics. So this is that somebody's getting tracked on. And the proof of the pudding is that metric actually improved to a new level of performance. OK? okay. Does anybody else want to share how they've chosen projects in their organization, as far as improvement areas? Okay, so let's see, I gotta get volunteers here. How about you this time? No, no, not you, okay, that's okay. That's fine, how about you? Okay, there you go. So in my uh, organization, actually, I have a good example and a bad one of choosing uh, oh, that's Six like Sigma projects. Uh, the bad one actually started from uh, asking, um, let's say, few uh, directors about what they would like to improve. And we had two or three, let's say, smaller initiatives that turned out to be not very le relevant. So the directors proposed um, uh, improvements there uh, that will not uh, create too much change or too much burden on them to work on. And this was not uh, a successful part. Uh, the other way around, let's say, uh, as a good example, uh, we started from um, the business uh, processes that had the biggest impact on the profits. And uh, we did some projects there. And of course, the results uh, were spectacular, let's say. So we had uh, uh, great achievements. But this uh, worked um, with high involvement from the top management. So initially, people were not so anxious on changing. 
her point is very valid, what I've seen. If the executive management is really, um, think a project is really important, then they take a lot of uh, interest in that. But then often what happens in times, we start losing interest in other projects that follow along. And so I'd like to be able to leverage like the second project you had as far as an overall system. And that's what I want to do because a lot of times what happens when somebody starts Lean Six Sigma, there's not just low hanging fruit, there's watermelons on the ground. But whenever those get taken off of the ground, it becomes harder to figure out which projects to work on that's going to benefit the business as a whole. And so that's what I'm really trying to do with a system for doing this. But in addition, I also want to have continually managing the processes using step number two. Okay, very good. Yes. I appreciate her asking a question. <laughs> I have a question related to step four business goal. In this methodology, the business goal should be strictly related to money, financial business goal, or could be improve customer uh, on-time delivery or uh, quality customer complaints? Well, I think the thing is, the relative to uh, the overall thing that you want to, I think you want to start or focus prime the business goal over here, but I want to be loose to that in that the business goal of improving this could lead to uh, more customers. So I want to increase this over here or I want to improve my profit margin. What I'm suggesting it could lead to those projects that you just talked about, improve customer satisfaction, things like that. So I think that there's a, a strong linkage. The problem we have with leading with just customer satisfaction, uh, even though that is very important as we know, a lot of times that lose visibility at the executive level. So what I'm suggesting, you really want to maybe talk the language that the executives know the most, and that's money, okay? And then what you can do is build your customer satisfaction with that, then when now they can see the linkage between that. But that's a very good point. Glad you brought that up. Yes. We're gonna to try to keep you doing a lot of exercise over here. <laughs> very good. Can failure be a source for project improvement to learn from failures, to analyze what did we, what, why did we fail and what can we do better to generate a project, a change project? Well, or, uh, 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 to identify a potential uh, improvement area? I think what you want to do is once you get to the project, then you're going to go in and try to figure out what caused it. See, I think one other problem that a lot of times people have or they start with, they st when they get it, we talked about big data at lunch or a break sometime, and they start going in and start analyzing the heck out of it, and they get into these rat holes. What I'm really trying to do is start at the high level here of the way life is and not react to all the ups and downs, then try to figure out what I should do to improve, or if that's important to improve, then I really want to start drilling into the causes. Because right now, you know, if you've got a large organization, you've got so many metrics and things that you could possibly work on that I don't want to go in and focus on, I want to focus on the things that can make the most impact to the business as a whole. You know, from, from this point of view. Now, as a process owner, that process owner would be, as part of BPM, still maybe trying to improve it and analyze this on their own. So they might want to say, well, do I get a differences between uh, people in the call center, you know, far as the quality of response that they're giving the people that are calling in. And they could do that on their own. And I think that's great. And that would be part of what I consider business process management, you know, as piece of it on the day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but right now we're focusing on projects that we believe are going to be the most benefit to the enterprise as a whole. Make sense? Yeah, indeed. I was meaning the great failures and not just a small failure in a working group. It's just the 
company failure or business failure because uh, unfortunately last years uh, have faced us to more to failures than to success because uh, market changed so much so we had so much to learn from our failures and well, I think that uh, maybe this is the dimension of failure I was having in mind. No, I, and I, think, I think that's important. You really want to learn from what we did wrong and try to analyze it. I was working for uh, one company and that they were at the end of the, uh, uh, the development process, they were going to say, well, um, since it's dealing with computers, it's, it's got a risk. There's, everything's not perfect. And they're going to do a risk analysis. And invariably, they'll say, we'll take the risk. Well, there's no accountability if they're wrong. You know, so it's easy to, you know, if you try to say stop it because um, we think there's high risk, you might feel like a gnat trying to stop a steamroller. You're going to get rolled over. It's probably not a very good career decision. But what you want to do is learn from the mistakes and create a feedback system. Hey, we took this risk and we shouldn't have. You know, and then and more importantly, then we'd also try to figure out what we should do in the development process that would actually uh, reduce the chance of us having that risk. I had one that was dealing with a, uh, it was an aluminum company and not aluminum company, but they made bumpers for cars or aluminum bumpers it was quite a few years ago. And I helped them use in design of experiments uh, reducing die breakage for a particular part they had. And they had been doing lean seven years. I did design of experiments to figure out what you might do differently. But I said, don't you think it's high risk that all your, uh, uh, you know, vast majority of the bumpers you're selling to is General Motors. This is before General Motors had all the problems. And uh, and they said, well, that's not our job. I said, but that's high risk. You know, you need to start looking at those sorts of things. And that's part of what we're doing here is the analyze piece, trying to figure out what are the risks associated with what you're doing. Okay. Very good. Any other questions, comments? Okay, good. So let's, now what we want to do is identify and execute projects. So execute project could follow one of the methodologies. So first you can have special cause conditions. Remember we were talking about tracking things here. Also we've got a blip up here. Well we might notice that a response time, for example, uh, on our computers went really bad on one day. Well that was when we had an electrical storm. Okay, well we knew the problem and uh, what caused it, and if we knew the solution, maybe we'd have more to have to have more protection. You know, something that we're going to be doing differently so we have less uh, chance of a problem. But we got the technical people together and they know what to do. So now we could just go in and do it. So that's a just do it project. Call it Nike, you know, Nike project, you know, do, just do it kind of. So now a special route, what if got special con and you don't know the solution. Well, what you could do is a root cause analysis, a decision tree and a fault tree analysis to try to help you figure out what you might do differently. Okay? And then you're going to go and address it. So this, again, is a special cause condition, um, and we don't really know what, what the issue is, but we might get the right people in the room and do a root cause analysis that helps us figure out what we ought to do differently. You've got another issue here, a common cause condition. And this is a solutions known. You might say, it's uh, our on-time delivery is not too good. So what you would do is put together a value stream map. This describes actually what you're doing. And then you do a Kaizen event, or you get everybody together to try to figure out what we actually do uh, to improve this. We might move machines around and things like that. The solution is fundamentally known but it's just a matter of getting it done. Kind of thing. So that's where the lean often fits into the big picture here. But keep in mind, my focus is really to improve these metrics. That's I'm really having a, a, a discipline of trying to improve these metrics. Let's say we got a common cause condition. So we got a lot of ups and downs, just like we had from our commute from home to work. And we don't know what we should do differently. So one thing what we could do is do Deming's plan, do, check, act. So we try different things that we might do to actually improve it. So let's looking at the uh, 
uh, what do we have? Did, uh, uh, let's see, on-time delivery here. Let's see. For customer satisfaction, maybe. We're looking at customer satisfaction, and we don't know exactly what to do. So we start doing a lot of different things, and then we uh, try to make it a little bit better. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do is like Google uh, trying to search engine rankings and stuff. Well, that's kind of like dealing with mystic stuff, you know, I don't know. And so we might still try to do different things to see if it improves your metrics. So it's kind of a plan, do, check, act on actually improving it, because we don't know what the answer is. Now, another approach here, if you've got common cause variability and you don't know the answer, then you could do a Lean Six Sigma project. So then you start analyzing it. Let's say, for example, the hospital, the time it takes uh, for delays in the, uh, the physicians, it's, it's longer than we'd like to have. So now we take that on as a project and we start analyzing. Well, it could be differences between physicians. It might be time of the day. It might be uh, uh, even perhaps a time of year because there may be people making more holidays. Uh, that may be the problem there. Or it could be uh, uh, Friday afternoon, people leave early. It could be something different than that. But notice we're using analytics to go in and helping us with that. That's following the DMAIC process. Define, measure, analyze, approve, control. So we're following that overall roadmap. And again, that's in the 1100-page the, uh, book, that roadmap steps by steps for that, and also the, the memory jogger. So that, that's the other way to do it. Now, the other thing is you could do is the demand V process. This is a design process. So now you're going to design a new process, or you could design a whole new product. You know, or the procedures or the process for developing new projects, products. So those are some things that you could do to do it. So it depends upon the situation on what particular roadmap you undertake. Okay. Now when you're getting into the uh, identify and execute projects, the Lean Six Sigma project roadmap uh, that I'm suggesting is the, the make like this, but it's also got a drill down on measure. So whenever I put together my roadmap initially, uh, I tried to align the, uh, the tools and put them in the same um, steps that GE did. This was in, you know, 98, okay? I did work at Bombardier uh, for uh, a company, and that's when I was introduced to the make roadmap, 97, 98. So implementing Six Sigma Wisconsin, he mentioned earlier, that's the uh, you know, book that I came out in 99, which is kind of like the first technical book on Six Sigma. But I've tried to put it in the roadmap, but I noticed how GE did not have uh, <clears throat> some of the tools, or some of the tools in the measure phase were not, uh, in my mind, truly measured. So for example, like you had measurement system analysis, and you had wisdom of the organization, where wisdom of the organization was dealing with flow charting, cause and effect diagram, cause and effect matrix, FMEA. So I kind of lumped that all to wisdom of the organization. <clears throat> then in 2003, my second edition of the Implement Six Sigma, I put lean here. <clears throat> I added lean, so it's truly integrated within the make roadmap. And then in my newer books, 2008, I put, uh, I put the lean also in the improve phase. Okay. So uh, now what I think is important with this overall roadmap is that everybody's thinking about executing the project using the make roadmap in the same way. So that's what I try to do in the uh, <clears throat> documenting all in a book. So each project should be judged against how well it fits within uh, uh, the overall organization's goals relative to what you're actually trying to improve. And then you want to maintain, or, and let me show you how to do this. So I want to go in and look at how well we actually achieved it. So the proof of the pudding that you actually achieved your process is actually the 30,000 foot level metric transitioning to a new level of performance, an improved level of performance. So this would describe how we did before and how we did after. So the one that uh, to the right represents this and here, so we can see that 
We reduced it to uh, uh, from 98 to 93 percent nonconformance, which is nothing to brag about it, but at least it made it better. <clears throat> but notice how we transition. So that's what I'd like to see for all process improvement projects if we're trying to move a metric. Now, if you got attribute data, then the thing is you don't use a probability plot. Okay, you would you're basically if you've got the defective rates and tracking over time, the center line of that, if they're all the same subgroup size, then that's your defective rate. So, but we can see now here that it actually transitioned now. <clears throat> so can somebody give me an example of uh, a situation where they would have it as continuous and the other one is attribute? Give me an example that you would have something here in your world. Yes. Okay, so, so what, what might you have? Okay, let's look at the difference between continuous and attribute. So continuous, it can take on measurements to it. So what's a, what maybe one of the examples that we had over here? Let's look at this one here. Let's go back to the first one, which I thought was a really good illustration. <clears throat> which one, you probably can't see. This one's dura duration. This was duration of that, the hospital, you know, the physician. Which one would that be, continuous? Continuous, right? You're looking at how long it takes. What about the second one, percentage of wrong diagnosis? Is it continuous or? Yeah, it'd be more attribute like this, right? So it's percentage, you had a thousand of them and percentage of them didn't meet that, okay? So now let's, so has everybody got the idea? But I want to get this into your real world, okay? Okay, let's see. Okay, how about you, in the, uh, the Brown, there? Can you give me an example of a continuous one that you might have in your work environment? Okay, so do, do, how about you? Do you want to, can you think of an example there? Yeah, maybe customer satisfaction. We are working in an outsourcing industry, and sometimes we had issues with um, customer satisfaction, and we had to put a plan, an improvement plan on that. We had to take the surveys, to look at the data, to analyze the samples, and then put an improvement plan for okay. that. And then we had to continue and follow up with the customer on, on the so customer satisfaction rate. How did you, how did you report customer satisfaction? This is kind of a tricky one. How did, how did you, uh, did you have a Likert scale, one to five? Or yeah, we actually had a scale, it was one to five. Um, okay. And we also looked at the return rate of the survey, because in our industry it's like 90%, not more than that, so we had to encourage also the end users to raise the survey so we can have some good sample for that. So this was return rate? Yeah, we had the return rate, yeah. The return so, rate was 20%, but the scale was one to five. Five was the best score that we can, we can get. Okay, so, but the return rate, that would be, that would be like this, right? You track the return rate. Pretty much. Pretty, pretty much, much like yeah. that. Now, the customer satisfaction one, one to five, is kind of a tricky one, because, you know, one, they're discrete, and the second thing is the distance between one and two the same as four and five? Not necessarily. It's not like a ruler. So, you know, one of the things that you might have to do with a customer satisfaction is say, if it's four or five, I consider it to be good. One, two, and three, it's not so good. And, and so then, then you want to go in and uh, look, at, uh, look at it as attribute, even though I'd rather have continuous. Because the customer satisfaction gets to be a problem on how you examine the data, uh, you know, as, you, as you probably found out, right? Okay, so what's another one? <clears throat> okay, how about you? Do you have, have some thoughts? 
No? She was talking about customer satisfaction? Okay. Another volunteer? By uh, SAS guys in United States, when you define your metrics and you want to plot your metrics to see how good you are against that metric, always strive to look for continuous data. It's more powerful and more meaningful for analysis. Can you speak up a little louder? I'm having trouble. Sorry. <laughs> Try to set up metrics. As I noticed, you corrected a little bit. My colleague, when she presented the KPIs at the board, instead of um, uh, percentage of uh, uh, consultancy uh, over the estimated uh, uh, time, uh, you mentioned you better plot the minutes uh, spent more than the standard uh, time. Okay. So continuous data are more powerful for analysis and more meaningful uh, for, for analysis. Uh, as many times you can avoid using attribute type data, uh, that's, that's good, it's helping you. Uh, okay, yep, I agree it. with you. Trying to get a continuous is what you would like to do. Sometimes you, you're forced into going in with attribute, you don't have a choice, but. Okay, good. So one of the objectives here is that everybody understands you know, how this, these metrics come together. So is there any questions about this? Okay, so uh, next what we want, we're moving on to the next step here, is we wanna maintain the, uh, see if it's maintained the gain. Now notice what happens with this overall process, we're looping back to step number three. We're not looping back to step number one. So basically what we have here is a Deming plan, do, check, act on the enterprise as a whole. Okay, now if we did a good job with improving our project process, what we did was we actually changed the procedures within our value chain, which impact the 30,000 foot level metrics, which impact the satellite level metrics. So that's the proof of the pudding that we really made a big difference or not. See how there's a line. But then what we have here, when we loop in back here, is this is a basically a Deming plan to check out for the enterprise as a whole. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the linkage of IEEE with this business process management. Now this is on a website here. You go to our website, Smarter Solutions, and then on the left-hand side is business system, and then you click on it. Now, on this business system here, what we have is basically on this y-axis, the, the vertical axis here, this represents the nine-step business system that we just talked about. Okay, so it starts with vision and mission, and this is your value chain. Then you got the enterprise analyze goals, enterprise improvement plan, improve and implement. And then you maintain the gain, and you kind of loop back up over here, and these represents various tools that you might use along the way. So this is a new graphic that we just put together because what we want to do is create a system for business process management integration. Now when I put this together, you know, in 2008 or so, I formalized it in the books, I always intended for my value chain to be something that would be incorporated on a day-to-day -day basis. But what this does is not everybody understood that. So what we're doing now is more formalizing it. So you got vision and mission, value chain, but you're also going in and using process analytic, process modeling, process design, process management, management rules and IT introduction. So these are aspects that are considered within business process management. Now these are part of business process management also, and they talk about some term enterprise process management. You know, and again, what we're trying to do here is integrate like the IT aspect within the overall business process management. Because the IT component is typically focusing on automation of processes. 
And what we want to do is part of even like the EIP, the Enterprise Proven Plan, might be one of our major things that we focus on is that the uh, automation of our, uh, one of our particular processes. But we want to automate a process that's actually uh, been improved and it's really working well before we try to automate it. Otherwise, if it's a bad process and we automate it, we can produce bad stuff more quickly now, which it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what I'd like to do now is have another exercise. Uh, what we're gonna do here is, uh, when was our break yet? Uh, when was our scheduled break? Do we have, uh, What the quarter? Half an hour from now? Okay. So what we're going to do is get started with this, and then uh, you know we're going to be using this hospital example, okay? And then uh, we're showing the various performance attributes of the hospital, and I'm going to be walking through that, and I'm, we're going to have some discussion on just setting this this up so that you understand what I've done. Because right now I'm pulling together basically the co the components or the concepts that we just talked about earlier. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to be showing basically this this hospital here, attributes of a hospital value chain. The team is to present results from the following in a flip chart presentation. But we'll just have you, uh, since there's so many teams, that probably is not going to work. But I want you to create an EIP, that's Enterprise Improvement Plan for projects, which benefit the enterprise as a whole. List the attributes of this and document the difference between this relative to traditional approaches. We're going to get improvement project selection and business management. Okay, now, uh, first off, what we're going to do is, again, walk through this nine steps. So this is a hospital, and uh, but it could be any situation that you might encounter. So the hospital is to maintain an occupancy rate in the top 10%, or we'll maintain a full employee, well you can read as well, as well as I can. So that's our vision. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to have a value chain. Okay, so this is the value chain of the hospital. So we're in step number two. So we're looking at voice of the customer, sales and marketing, deliver clinical service, invoice and collect, report financials. And then these are IT, housekeeping, food and service, and so on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna demonstrate through PowerPoint, you know, but if uh, I could go into the internet and I can actually go in and pull this information from our server in Austin. So I made it this way so you can actually see it a little bit better because sometimes it, it gets pretty small. So keep in mind this is, I'm, I'm representing what you can actually see within the uh, overall value chain. So let, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna click on this. So this is the value chain here. Everybody okay with that? That's the value chain. So we're representing that you're clicking on this and what it does is then it gives you, this is a, a drill down. It's a drill down of your value chain. Now, what do you have in here? Well, I wanna have Y and I wanna have X's. So this represents my Y First off, this represents the X's, and I just put some step numbers in here. That's a generic value, you know, value stream map, flow chart or value stream map. This represents your Y's. Now this is not necessarily complete, but this is what we have here. So if I got a little link on it here, that means I got a metric below it. Okay. But you notice what I have is Y is a function of X. So I'm putting together my X's and linking them closely to the Y, the overall response. Everybody okay with that? 
So the so let's go in now. What we're going to do is clickable. So this is clickable by anybody throughout the company that has authorization. So now what we're doing is linking our processes directly with our metrics. So what I'm doing now is I'm clicking on this. So I'm tracking now the overall financials of the company. So I'm looking at profit margins. So you, now notice here, this is a low value. This is a high value. What I don't want to have is that people react into all those ups and downs as common cause variability. I don't want to have the executive say, why, Mary, why is this one low and this one's high? I don't want to do that. I want to go in and say, <clears throat> we might have a problem with our profit margins, but I don't want to go in and look at all the ups and downs and try to explain what happened to those ups and downs. Now it's important that if you don't understand that you ask a question. So we can understand that we had a change in the process, which leads to uh, worse results. Yeah. If I correctly understand. So we changed something in our process, and then this was followed by a worsening of the process because now that's the results are lower. That's a valid point, because at this point in time, it got worse. Okay. But I don't want to react all these ups and downs, but now we'll say, hey, it got worse. How bad is it? Okay, so now what we're going to do is we'll take these particular values, those six values, and plot them on this probability plot. Okay, and now we say the process is predictable. Since the last process changed, that doesn't mean it's good, but the median is 9.9, .9 and 80% of the current, whoops, let me look at it this way. The median is 9.9 .9 with 80% occurrence between 8.7 and 11.2. Okay. Do I have anywhere here on the, this sheet the target? I mean, I should have a target for the profit margin, which is, I don't know, 11 or 12. Is it somewhere here? Because I should compare anyhow, at least, results against the target. Even I should not react when the process is stable, but I should compare. Well, the, that's a very good point. He's talking about he wants to establish a target. But whenever you start doing that way, you'll start going in. If you make that statement by itself, people are going to start looking at red, yellow, green scorecards. Okay, and I'm suggesting you want to do that. What I'm suggesting here is we're, we haven't even established a target yet. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we want to establish a target later to go in and move it. And eventually what we're going to get to is a target on going forward is I want to get this value up to here, back up to here. That would be my target. But I'm looking at the average value for, for profit margins. But I want to figure out what to do differently to get there. Because right now, that's going to be our target here, but we haven't decided that yet. So I'm given information. We might have, you might be part of the executive team when we're just trying to decide what to actually do to establish that target. See, what I'm trying to lead to is not just taking a target that came down from above, but we're actually helping the executive team create the target that makes good physical sense. Okay, but one, at one point in the time, I will get the target. And I will still look on this kind of graph. Should the target appear here? No, even I establish it. Well, if you, you can go in and put anything you want in the comments. You can go in and, uh, like, I don't show it here because I don't have the software done up here. But if I did have the software here, I can establish this as a red color that, hey, we got problems here. And then I can just put in the comments that we want to go in. Our goal is to improve the profit margins uh, in 15 months or 12 months or 7 months, whatever we decide on. See, we're going to be getting to that. And that's actually what I'm going to be asking you to do is, I'm kind of giving you the answer a little bit, and I shouldn't do that, I guess. But that's going to be part of the exercise. You guys are going to determine what the profit margins should be or what your goals should be. Okay, I'm going to be asking you that, but I'm going to be giving you data 
to help you go in and decide what those targets should be. So that's part of the exercise. Yeah? Okay. Thank but you. I'm giving you data to make those decisions. So again, you're part of the executive team, remember? Now you notice here, we can also put comments down here. Profit margins declined from a median of 11.9 to 9.9. .9. So that's not good, okay? But the point is, is we got common cause variability. We didn't have well, all of a sudden that has spiked downward. There was a trend downward. It, it all of a sudden changed, okay? So then what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start looking at voice of the customer. We're, to, we're moving to analyzing the enterprise. We're looking at our value chain to what we might do. So if we go in and click on voice of the customer, then what you have again, you got your process for collecting voice of the customer. You also have your Y values here. Okay. So if we go in and start looking at voice of the customer, what we did is this, is we might have had a, like a Likert scale like you talked about. And then uh, if it was a four or five, then we said it was good. But if it was a two, one, two, or three, that was dissatisfied. So we're looking at the dissatisfaction that we had. So this is another 30,000 foot level chart. You can see it's tracked over here. And we're going to have just ups and downs. These are common cause variability, like the, you know, what we talked about in the example, 25 to 35 minutes in our commute time. So it's not gonna all be the same. See, again, red, yellow, green scorecards would have just put in a bar around over here, and if it got above or below a certain number, then you'd react to it. So where I'm not doing that, and I'm saying we had common cause variability, but notice what happened here, it shifted worse. So that's not good, right? So what we noticed here now, if we look at the statement at the bottom, is that the process is predictable, the estimated performance rate capability is about 0.13 non-conformance rate. So in other words, 13% of the people that we surveyed were not happy. Okay? Now we notice also, we could put comments in this. So now we put the comments on what was observed here, and we say that customer feedback, poor room cleanliness, unfriendly staff, and spent a lot of times waiting. It's like a murder mystery, who done it? Okay. So let's go in and move to sales and marketing. Again, we got generic flow chart. We got our metrics. So again, if we don't like these metrics, we have to change our procedures over here. So changing our procedures could affect market share. But we don't know if we ought to be working on that as a project or not. Okay. So what do you think about this? So what conclusion could you draw on this? It's linked with the previous ones. Yeah. We decreased the margin share because we lost the market share. We lost the market share, which leads to decreasing the margins because we probably reduce the sales, and um, then there, there is a linkage. So it's, it's actually indicated the same trend, that okay. the, the business it's, uh, is getting worse. Okay, so, uh, so this is what the statement is here that we have. Okay, so... Uh, and this is the, some other comments that we had over here. We notice now on this particular time it decreased from about 56 to 53%. Okay, and then uh, 
Notice, if we, I didn't put this up here, but there's another hospital was opened by a competitor. So this has given us some information, right? Okay, so now we've moved over to the other value chain here. Again, this is all clickable, all clickable. And so now what we're doing is looking at, uh, these are the metrics that we have relative to quality, cost, and time. We're linked to length of stay here, and we're also looking at weekly error rate. So what I'll do is I'll be, you can go in, then this is, this is pulling from the, through the internet, this is pulling from, from Austin. So you can go in and click on the iPad. So you just click on it, get that right? So you can do the, the drill downs here. So you, like we're looking at the uh, delivered clinical services. So that's, that's the one we got right here. So you can pass that around. Look at, so this is collecting it, this is actually reporting it in real time. So again, this is the generic flow chart here. Okay, and again, we got length of stay and uh, the amount of defects that we had. Okay, so let's go in and look at length of stay. Do you think, what do you think that's gonna be, continuous response or attribute? Yes. yes. Continuous response. Uh, uh, continuous. Continuous, okay. Here, I'll do it this way. How about this? Okay, so that's, yes, very good. And now what we got here is, uh, so what we're doing now is link that uh, length of stay over time here. Okay, so what, what do you notice here? What are we gonna be tracking here? Now this one looks a little different. It's a continuous response, right? So on the chart on the left-hand side, you know what we're looking at? You have a chart on it? It's an eye chart, read what tip to the top. Maybe it's a little bit, what's the fourth word in there? Eye chart of the mean value. We're looking at length of stay in the hospital we're looking at the average length of stay. So this represents here the time, right? There's different times. So we're looking at the average length of stay in the hospital, right? That makes sense? What are, we, what are we looking over here? Standard deviation, right? So if you had, let's say you had uh, 100 people for as length of stay, in, and we're gonna look at every week, we're looking at the average time, and also we're looking at the standard deviation. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now what, okay, so why don't you pass it to him next door? Okay, so what is this doing, a probability plot? So, this is saying what? This process is, is stable and predictable, right? Okay, very good. And then next obvious question is, what do you predict, right? Okay. So we're coming back and we've got the raw data here that we're actually going in and uh, compiling. So what percentage did I pull off of this? I don't know if you can read it from there or not. 10, 50, and 90, right? Okay. So now I come back over here and I got a value of 262.8, that's there. And then I got the 90 and 10, which represent these two values there. So what does that physically mean? Can you tell me in words? Can you just share, anybody in the table that wants to share? Uh, 
I think that you will not need to buy more beds because uh, the patients are staying smaller times and uh, the number of patients you have are less. So no investition in uh, beds, materials, etc. So I think one thing that I think what you just said, as far as our profit margins, by increasing number of beds is not going to make any difference, right? Because we're yes. trying to improve profit margin. It's a stable process, right? So we can cut investitions. Yeah, so we, this is probably an, a metric that we should not necessarily be working on in order to improve our financials. Is that a fair statement? Could be. Yeah, because it, it hasn't changed. You know, because right now where profit margins changed, and right now this is stable. Okay? And then, and so now this says where the process is, but uh, it doesn't really look like it makes a difference here. Okay? So any questions on that? So do, are you starting to see how this might apply to your situation? What other situations might you have that would represent, um, be tracked like this? What other situations might you have? Can you think of one? There was the situation uh, with the other hospital opening in the, in the area. You could track that by this chart. Okay, what about uh, one of them far as in your world might be if you send out invoices, right? And you'd like to get them back on time? Sure. Okay, so now let's say for example you had uh, each week, you know, you had a thousand invoices that, or you know, payments came in, and they were, you looked at how long or how late each one of those invoices are, so you could track the average time for those thousand and the standard deviation, and then you could plot the probability plot here to describe the variability that you're having relative to the due date. So if it's one day late, it's a one. If it's two days late, it's two. If it's minus one, it's a minus one. So now you can describe to the management, to, to your boss, how your invoice process is relative to late. Okay? Yes. Do you see that? Okay. Yeah. So is there any other questions about the way I'm reporting this? Yes. I don't see anywhere the unit of measure. What is this, days or? Uh, days. So. Oh, no, these are hours. Is, these are hours. hours Excuse no? me. Okay. Yeah. Because it's now well, mentioned there. And no, you're right. To these stay are, more these than are, one year in the no, hospital. Probably. Yeah, no, I understand. I'm sorry. This should, this would be hours, and this period would be like every week. So you're looking at the average time it takes for each one of them per week and the standard deviation. So there is a legend for each of the table, or how do we settle and uh, understand? Uh, well, for each? okay, that was my bad. Okay, we should go in and put it put a legend on there to say what it would be. All right. Yep. No, good point. Thank you. Okay. okay, so what we came about from uh, this particular process is that uh, we really sh uh, shouldn't be working on that particular one at all, but let's look at the defective rates. Okay, so now is this is this continuous or attribute? It's attribute, right? So we're looking at uh, the errors per thousand patients. So you had an error or you didn't have an error. So we don't do a probability plot on that. And so now we estimate it that it's 10.84. So this would be the weekly errors per thousand. Okay. So notice here we made an improvement. It went down. Well, that's good news. 
But should we be working on this particular process relative to improving pro uh, performance? She's shaking her head no. You agree with her? Yeah, it's, it's probably something that may be good to work on, but not for this particular uh, effort of actually proving profit margins. So can you give me another situation where that you might have an attribute? I just want to continually drive in this home to you. Can you think of an attribute situation? Can't think of an attribute situation? Can you think of an attribute situation you might have in your work? Do you have defective rates? Nonconformance issues? Yeah, of course. Okay, well that's an example. So you did something, it was a nonconformance or not. This could be transactional processes. So I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm sending out an invoice, I maybe made mistakes or I didn't. So that's how you could track that. Okay? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, okay. Say it again so everybody else heard you. Okay. I, I was saying that uh, sales success rate can be one of the, um, um, the measures. How many deals you closed out of the offers you have uh, sent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Okay, so uh, let's see, it's about, about break time, is that what you're telling me? So let's say, why don't we take, how, how long, half an hour, is that again, or what? So, huh? Half an hour? Okay, so we're gonna take a, okay. Până la patru și un sfert. Nu uitați de chestionare, de cărțile de vizită la stand de Bonaventura, dacă vreți să câștigați un premiu de la ei. Și vă așteptăm înapoi peste jumătate de oră.